So again, my name is Kit Miller, and I have the good fortune to serve as a director here in Rochester, New York, for the M.K. Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence. It's a tremendous honor and privilege for me to introduce Paul Chappelle. I've read all of his books. I'm an enormous fan. He's been here since last night, and we've had wonderful conversations. There was an article about Paul a year ago in The Sun magazine. I'm going to read you just a little bit about him. Paul Chappelle was born and raised in Alabama, the son of a Korean mother and a half-white, half-African-American father who served in Korea and Vietnam. Though Paul had seen, oh my God, my glasses. Though Paul had seen his father uh, affected by serving in the military, he chose to go into the military because of his own focus on wanting to understand more about violence in the world. He's written three books. One just came out, Peaceful Revolution, and I've never been more excited to have someone come and be a Gandhi Distinguished Lecturer than I am tonight. Please help me welcome Paul Chappelle. Can all of you hear me in the back? Can all of you hear me? Okay. How about now? Okay. All right. If you can't hear me, please raise your hand. So all of you should have a sheet of paper on your chair. Can you all take that out, please? It's a quote from General Douglas MacArthur. And I'll go ahead and read it out loud. General Douglas MacArthur, five-star general, West Point graduate, very influential in making West Point what it became. He said, you cannot control war, you can only abolish it. Those who shrug this off as idealistic are the real enemies of peace, the real warmongers. Those who lack the enterprise, vision, and courage to try a new approach when none others have succeeded fail completely the simple test of leadership. So here he talks about a new approach other than war to provide security to the country and to the planet. And that is the same approach as we will talk about tonight that Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. pioneered and that we must continue. And another very interesting thing about this quote is he talks about abolishing war. And the abolition of war, the end of politically organized violence between countries, it has a very popular name, far more common name known as world peace. But it's hard to talk about world peace in our country. And why is that? If you say world peace, what do most people think? Or what's their reaction if you say, I want world peace? Hippies, right? What else? What comes to mind when you hear world peace? If you were to talk about it, pardon? Idealistic. Idealistic, right? And I think a lot of people think of beauty pageants, right? <laughs> beauty pageant contestants. Have any of you seen the movie Miss Congeniality? Yep. With Sandra Bullock? Well, there's a scene in the film where there's a beauty pageant. An interviewer asks the beauty pageant contestants what they want, and they all say, world peace. It's supposed to be a joke, right? Because world peace is supposed to be a joke. But is it? That's what we'll talk about tonight. So please raise your hand if you think world peace is impossible. No skeptic? No, pardon? My lifetime. At all. Possible at all. OK, raise your hand if you think world peace is possible. OK. Raise your hand if you're not sure. OK. Most hands go up on that one, typically. And we'll talk about that tonight. And I can tell you what I thought about world peace when I was growing up, because I didn't grow up in the peace movement. So for a long time, I thought that world peace was a naive dream. My father served in the army for 30 years, and he fought in the Korean and Vietnam wars. My mother lived in Japan during World War II, and she lived in Korea during the Korean War. I graduated from West Point. I served in the army for seven years. I was deployed to Baghdad, and left the army just two years ago as a captain. So I grew up very skeptical of this whole peace thing. I grew up very conservative. I used to listen to right-wing radio religiously. And I believed in war as a security paradigm. I believed war makes us safe. War protects our freedom. War protects democracy. War makes the world safer. You listen to President Bush or President Obama. They both say that war makes our country safe, helps people in the Middle East, and is building a more prosperous future. But if we want to really talk about whether there's another path or if world peace is possible, we have to ask a much deeper question. And that question is, are human beings naturally violent or naturally peaceful? If human beings are naturally violent and war is something that we're supposed to do, then it would be naive to assume that world peace could ever happen. 
But if human beings are naturally peaceful, and we have to be trained and conditioned to become violent, then world peace just might be possible. World peace just might have a chance. So please raise your hand if you think human beings are naturally violent. Okay. A few hands go up. Raise your hand if you think human beings are naturally peaceful. Raise your hand if you think human beings are naturally violent and naturally peaceful. <laughs> Most hands go up on that one. Most of the time. And we'll talk about that. And I'll ask you a few questions to get to the truth of the matter. So the first question, what is the greatest problem of every army in world history? Every army in world history, no matter what time period or culture, has a single greatest problem. Can any of you guess what that problem is? Every army's greatest problem. Getting people to sign up. Recruiting, that's a big problem. Recruiting is a big problem. And armies, by the way, have lots of problems. Recruiting, logistics, supply, the opposing army. You have to defeat the, the opposing army. But the problem I am talking about is even bigger than the opposing army. Because if you don't solve this problem, the battle won't even begin. Oh, great answer. Getting soldiers to kill. Great answer. Getting soldiers to kill is a very big problem, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Another great answer. Any other thoughts? Great answer, getting soldiers to kill. That is a very big problem, but there's an even bigger problem than that. The greatest problem of every army in world history isn't getting soldiers to kill, it's getting soldiers to die. The greatest problem of every army in world history is when a battle begins, how do you stop soldiers from running away? In combat, our flight response is far more powerful than our fight response. Most people's natural reaction when you try to stab them with a sword or shoot them with a rifle, most people's natural reaction is to run away as fast as they can, as far as they can. Ask anyone who's been in combat and they will tell you it's terrifying. And General Patton said, anyone who says they're not afraid in combat is a liar. So if I went out in the street right now and pulled a knife on somebody, most people would be terrified. Most people would be terrified, want to run. And their instinct to run from me would be more powerful than their instinct to fight me. So what if I said to one of you in the audience, I said, OK, I'll pull a knife on you, and I'll give you a knife, and we're going to knife fight. Not a very appealing proposition, right? Your instinct to get away from me is more powerful than your instinct to fight me for most people. And now here you are in war telling these 5,000 soldiers, run towards these people, and these 5,000 people want to cut your head off. Or maybe the opposing army even outnumbers you. How do you get them to fight? So how did armies throughout history learn to make soldiers fight and not retreat? What is the most effective method the armies throughout history have learned, have used, to make soldiers fight and not retreat? Propaganda. Propaganda? What kind of propaganda? Hatred, right? Hatred for the enemy. Great answer. Hatred for the enemy. But a lot of people won't die for hatred. They might kill for hatred, but they won't actually die for hatred. Pardon? Conditioning. Great answer. We'll talk about, oh, brotherhood. Great answer. It's actually much simpler than we realize, and brotherhood's a big part of it. So here's a question for all of you to make this answer very clear. What would all of you die for? Raise your hand if you would risk your life to protect your family. See? Almost every hand goes up. That's why armies have this band of brothers and camaraderie. That's why every war in human history is always about self-defense, according to national leaders. We're fighting to protect our family. These evil people want to come kill our family. And I think Lao Tzu, a Chinese philosopher, said it best when he said, by being loving, we are capable of being brave. The Greeks realize that if soldiers believe they're fighting to protect their friends, their family, and their loved ones, they will not only fight, but they will even sacrifice their lives, because our instinct to protect our loved ones is far more powerful than our instinct for self-preservation. Think about how you would react if you saw your loved ones being attacked. Think about how you would rush to their aid and try to protect them. So here's a story that makes this very clear. A few years ago on the radio, I heard a story. Years ago, is the microphone? Is it is it out? Pardon? You can hear me? Okay. So a few years ago, I heard a story about a woman on the radio. She was being interviewed, told a story. She was walking down the street and there was a loose pit bull running toward her. So what would you do if you're walking down the street and there was a loose pit bull running toward you? Would your instinct be to fight the pit bull or to run from the pit bull? Run from the pit bull, right? It's madness fighting a pit bull. Your flight response is far more powerful than your fight response when a pit bull is running at you. Now, this woman is walking down the street, a loose pit bull running toward her, but she had her little poodle with her. And the pit bull ran up and bit her poodle.